Noah's Ark is such a cute story, isn't it? <laughs> this came from our firstborn's nursery. Everything in it was Noah's Ark, animals two by two. They were just so adorable, so comforting. You know, we domesticate the stories of the Old Testament just like, and truth be told, we domesticated our firstborn's nursery. Anybody want to guess what song this music box plays? Maybe row, row, row your boat, or maybe... <laughs> no, this one plays It's a Small World from Disney World. <laughs> Such a strange contrast of images, don't you think? <laughs> and the domestication is precisely why we don't give in this church our youngest children stories from the Hebrew Scriptures. Because if you read the story as it was originally written, it's a little frightening. And young children don't have any ability to determine the past, the present, and the future. So if we get a nor'easter or a hurricane that begins to flood North Street and Middle Street and they're looking out their window, they think Noah's Ark is happening all over again, except this time they're not on the boat. Why do we do it? Why do we focus on these stories and turn them into cute little tales with It's a Small World melody underneath. I'm not sure why we do it. But the truth of the matter is, because we do it, most folks never go back to these stories and ever look at them again in adulthood. That's what I did when I was in Sunday school as a little kid. Noah and the Ark. Daniel and the Lion's Den. I still remember my craft project for Daniel and the Lion's Den. There's the lion with a happy smiley face and Daniel right beside him. Somehow I don't think Daniel and the lion were happy smiley faces at that point. Peter, in the second reading today, tells us what he understood this story to me. And Peter and all those church fathers after him through the Byzantine era to the folks that made the beautiful mosaic that you find on the front of your bulletin, they understood the story of Noah and the ark to be something very, very different. They didn't domesticate it. But they saw that it prefigured something important about Jesus. They believed that everything in the Hebrew Scriptures pointed to Jesus Everything in the Hebrew Scriptures gave a pattern that Jesus fulfilled. Everything in the Hebrew Scriptures led us to understand that Jesus was the Messiah and the things that He did and the things that He taught helps us to understand who we are, what our identity is, how we are to live as people of God. And Peter says the story of Noah and the ark prefigures, foreshadows, baptism. How many of you ever, when you read the story of Noah and the ark, finished and said, that is the best baptism story I have ever heard? Probably none of us, because we've lost that richness and that connectedness to those early church beliefs. But the truth of the matter is, Peter said, just as eight people were saved through water in the ark, so baptism saves you. How does that work? Well, let's go back and look at the story. Noah was asked by God at a time when the earth was broken and full of sin, and he said, I'm going to make the world and wash it clean. I want you to make an ark, and in that ark, God put everything of his creation and put eight human beings in there, and for 40 days and 40 nights, the rain poured and everything flooded, and the entire creation was washed clean. And when the waters receded, the door was opened and Noah and the animals went out and God put a rainbow in the sky, said, never again will I destroy the earth by water and I give you a pristine, beautiful, 
paradise to start over again. Clifford and I were yesterday at the Greek festival, and it's the first time I got a chance to see the inside of Annunciation Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Norfolk, and I always wanted to see inside because it kind of looks like a Presbyterian church on the outside, and I knew the inside must be very different, and it is. The iconostasis and all the icons were stunning. But the thing that struck us most, and everybody who came in for the tour, was all over the floor were leaves and dried up flower petals. It looked like the doors had been left open and everything had blown in for weeks. And the question was asked, what's on the floor? And they said, oh, we're so excited to tell you about that. They said, on Holy Saturday morning, as we're getting ready for the great vigil of Easter, we have a service of preparation. And we bring in two enormous baskets. And in those baskets, they're filled with bay leaves, rose petals, orchids, any fragrant flower, any fragrant leaf. And they're filled to the brim, enormous baskets. And while the priests and the choir sing, about God through Christ Jesus restoring creation, we toss all this stuff in the air and it goes all over the floor. And that night, when people come for the great vigil of Easter and the doors are open and they come into the darkness, they enter paradise. They enter a garden full of fragrant flowers. And for the entire 40 days that we celebrate Christ's risen presence on earth, every time we walk on the floor, it squishes and scrunches, and the fragrance of those herbs and flowers comes up, and we're reminded that the creation was washed and made new through Jesus. So follow me. This is what Peter would say, and this is what those that came after him would say. Look up. Literally, look up right now. You are in the ark. That's why the roof looks like that. You are in the place in which you are saved through faith. You come into this ark and you are broken and you are soiled. And look at what is at the beginning at the entrance of each place. We have water. We have water. You come into this ark through water. You die and rise again. And when you come out the other side, you enter a pristine new creation. You are washed clean. You are on the journey to paradise. You're not there yet. Yes, you'll sin again. Yes, the brokenness of the world is still there. But the ark prefigures paradise. What you will receive through the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus in baptism. So Peter firmly asserts, just as Noah's ark saved eight people, so baptism saves you. So you are empowered. So you are cleansed. And Jesus in today's gospel says, And when I leave you, I will not leave you alone. The Advocate will come. The Holy Spirit will be with you so that you can hear the voice of the Good Shepherd who calls you by name. And Peter goes on to say, because you are cleansed, because you are in the ark of God, because you are entering into paradise, you have no reason to fear. Do not be afraid to share the good news of what Christ has done for you. And do not be afraid and do not be discouraged when people malign you and abuse you and persecute you for what you say. For you are redeemed. You are part of the new creation. Nothing can ever happen to you that will ever separate you from the love of God. So you have no reason to fear. You have every reason to be bold. You have every reason to give up the petty domestication of stories like Noah's Ark and proclaim with boldness that the Lord Jesus has changed your life forever. And the Lord Jesus offers to change the lives of all who come to him. So sisters and brothers, we journey in this ark together. We who have been saved through water. The only question is, how bold will we be
What testimony will we share? Will we live as people who are part of the redeemed new creation? <coughs> For that is what will save.